So you orient yourself towards some good, the highest good that you can conceptualize, and it has to be through a consultation with your ancestors, because you need to do the things that people have always done, and you need to do them properly, and you need to assume that that's the way that you should live, unless you have a very good reason to change it dramatically, and maybe you do, but you, you got to start with some axiomatic set of presuppositions, because otherwise you have to invent everything on your own, and you don't have enough time to do that, so you, you have to use normative guidelines. And if you don't, then people won't know what to do with you, that's another big problem, if, if you live completely outside the norm. I mean, you know, remarkable artists manage that to some degree, but of course they pay for the privilege by being remarkable artists, so if there's something truly remarkable about you, perhaps you can justify deviating from the normative path, but if there isn't, first of all, there's nothing remarkable enough about you to justify deviating in every way from the normative path, no matter how remarkable you are. So. So that's part of the, the rescuing of the father from the, from the depths, is to, to reunite yourself with the traditional structures of your community. You can do that in a way that you feel suits your own needs best, but I don't think you can not do it, because it makes you weak, and then you'll drown. All right, so let's say you have oriented yourself, but not perfectly, because you're full of mistakes and errors. So then what do you do? because you have to fix those errors, but you still have to be oriented. And this is why I started get interest, to get interested in the phenomena of meaning, as a, as a phenomenological experience, to experience something as meaningful. It's not exactly obvious what that means, to experience something as meaningful. I think that you can, you can approach it obliquely, you know, like if I said, watch yourself for two weeks and notice when you're doing something that you regard as meaningful. I could say, well, here, here's some, here's some markers. You lose a sense of time, you lose a sense of vulnerability, you're deeply engaged in it. It seems, it seems worth the effort, right? You forget yourself while you're doing it. Um, maybe you forget your existential concerns while you're doing it. You're not <coughs> ruminating or obsessing about the meaning of your life, right? So, so there's markers for it. It's like the flow states that Csikszentmihalyi described. Um, and then you can experience it, you experience it under certain sort of ritualistic conditions. You might experience it when you go see a great movie. You might experience it when you listen to music. I think music is a very, very standard pathway for people to have that kind of experience. Because virtually everyone gets intimations of, mu of meaning from music. And I think music, music is hierarchically structured patterns that are representative of being laying itself out properly, it's something like that, so it's an abstract representation of proper being. And so, we can, we can grapple with the phenomena of music, and we can, we can box, or phenomena of meaning, we can box it in a little bit and start to conceptualize it. We can con start to conceptualize it perhaps as the manifestation of a deep instinct. And so I would say, well, meaning is what manifests itself when you are when you've oriented yourself properly, and when you've optimized the flow of information between you and you, between you and chaos, that might be the right way of thinking about it. Because you think about a piece of music, is you want it to be predictable, but you don't want it to be perfectly predictable. You want it to be predictable with some interesting variations, and predictable with some variations that make sense. And maybe you can conceptualize that as something like this. It's like it's predictable at this order of, of stability, but it's, it's varying down here from time to time. And so you've got stable stability there, but variability there, and you can handle that. So you want an overarching structure of stability with some internal variability. And maybe that's the way that you update yourself without falling apart. And then I would say, you can find the pathway to the up, optimal rate of update, by relying on your sense of meaning. That's what it's for. What it tells you is that you're, you're wandering your way through the world between the catastrophes of chaos and the catastrophes of order, and now and then you swing into the proper locale. You're, you're where you should be. And what happens is you get engaged by that. You get meaningfully engaged by that. And it's fragile, it'll move on you, right? Because it's very difficult to exist at that point constantly. Your bad habits, all sorts of things, your situation, there's all sorts of things that are going to interfere with that. But that doesn't mean 
that that isn't where you should be. And so then you might say, well, that's where you should strive to be all the time. And then the question might be, well, what would it be like if you were there all the time? And I think that's where intimations of paradise come from. I mean, when words, I think it was Wordsworth talked about intimations of immortality and childhood, people tend to romanticize their childhood because of the sense of in, intense engagement that goes along with being a child. And it's one of the wonderful things about being around children, actually. It's, it's, it's one of, they pay you for their care. And the way that children pay you for their care is that they turn normal things into magic again when you're around them. Because you've seen it a hundred times before. And so when you see it, you don't see it. You see what you already know. But when a child sees it, they don't, because they don't know. They see it, and then when you watch them see it, you see it too. And so it's just it's tremendous fun leading a small child around to do things that you've done before, because they're so, you know, they're like this. They're like all the time, and you know, maybe that's too much, and they cry, and they get upset, and all of that, but a good part of the time, it's just wild-eyed wonder, and then you can see the world through their eyes, and it's payment. And, and so that's, that sense of being engaged like that is something that people love about children, and, and rightly so. But it's also a marker to a, the proper way of being. You know, there, there's a dictum in the, this is a Jungian idea, that there's no difference between the archetype of the wise old man and the archetype of the child. They're the same thing. Because the wise old man is the person who found what he had in childhood but lost. Right, it's a, that's a very powerful motif, is that the purpose of maturation is to return to the state of childhood as a mature being. Not to stay in the state of childhood, that's Peter Pan. But to make the sacrifices necessary for maturation and then return. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, you do that in part by noting what it is that's meaningful you, for you to engage in. I would say it's your nervous system reporting to you, right hemisphere and left hemisphere balanced. The, the balance between chaos and order produces an output that says you are in the right place. It's a perception, the meaning is a perception of being in the right place. It's the genuine thing. However, because it, it can be pathologized, that's the thing, and that's why I think there's a call to virtue in most great religious traditions. If you're going to rely on your sense of meaning to orient you, you have to play a straight game. Because otherwise you warp and twist the inputs and then the mechanism won't function properly. You know, it's like if you, if you were only, if, you're, if you've blinded yourself to half the world, you can't use your perceptions to orient yourself properly because the half of the world that you're ignoring is going to pop up at you unexpectedly and take you down. And so if your relationship with the world isn't pristine, honest, primarily, then you can't rely on your own internal orienting mechanisms. And then you either fall into chaos, which is an absolute catastrophe, or you have to rely on some kind of external authority. And that makes you prone to possession by tyrannical ideologies, for example, which give you that sense of meaning that you should, in fact, have as a consequence of your own action. 